I feel almost like at home in Munich. Uh, the whole day has been so disciplined. We're in, on time. <laughs> so the changes are really minor from one side of the Atlantic to the other. And I'd also, before I welcome our keynote speaker, I'd like to say that two years ago, I had the pleasure to introduce Leon Wieseltier in Munich. And while he hardly needed to be introduced there, he certainly does not to be introduced in Washington. Makes my job very easy tonight. Rather than presenting you with a Vita, which would probably fill the rest of the day, I will restrict myself to very, very few words which are related to the topic of our conference. Leon Wieseltier's academic home, I would argue, is Jewish studies. As a graduate at Harvard, he was a disciple of Yosef Chaim Yerushalmi. And in contrast to most of us in academia, he then actually went on to a real world profession. I do not refer to his acting career in one episode of The Sopranos, <laughs> but of course to his journalistic career. He is now, and correct me if that's wrong, in his 30th year as the literary editor of The New Republic, and I should say this is in a world which does not know tenure positions. Leon Wieseltier published books both in fiction and nonfiction. His Kaddish stands out as a remarkable contribution to the field of Jewish studies. Israel, too, has always been near the center of his writings. He translated, for example, the Israeli poet Yehuda Amichai into English. And I would argue that he made the New Republic one of the most informed and balanced resources on Israeli society and politics. In his latest contribution, entitled Good Fences, Bad Neighbors, he struggles with the physical and even more the mental walls that are being constructed in Israel. I read this piece as expressing his profound affection for and also his deep worries about Israel. I would say it is as affectionate as it is provocative. Let us welcome Leon Wieseltier a genuine representative of Jewish learning, profound knowledge of Israeli society, and who could be better for keynote address on Israel studies, Jewish studies, same but different. A few weeks ago, I had the pleasure of being Elon's guest at Brandeis to give a talk about Zionism. And one of the things I did in that talk, uh, for what it was worth, was do a very quick tally of the failures and the successes of Zionism, some of which are obvious, some of which are not. Um, Zionism's great successes were obviously in the restoration of Jewish state sovereignty, in the restoration, and even more than the restoration, in the creation of a language, which I regard as even a more miraculous success than the creation of the state, um, and the return of the Jewish people to some form of autonomous collective power. Um, great successes all. Uh, in other respects, Zionism did not succeed. It did not succeed in uh, persuading all the Jews in the world to emigrate to the Holy Land for a variety of reasons. Uh, if, like me, you're one of those Jews who believes that there's nothing intrinsically illegitimate about a diaspora, that may not count as a very great failure, but that's a subject for another day. Um, Zionism did not succeed in resolving the question of anti-Semitism, in some ways it refocused it, resharpened it, transposed it to a new region, uh, and so on, all the things you know. One of the, when one looks, when one does the, 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 the cheshpan on Zionism, one of the things that one thinks about is the question of whether or not the Zionists succeeded in their cherished goal of the normalization of the Jewish people. Uh, there are many interpretations of that phrase, but whatever we mean by it, there is the question of whether or not Zionism and the establishment of the State of Israel, the restoration of Jewish state sovereignty, um, did have the consequence of in any significant way eliminating or modifying the anomalous position of the Jews in the world. And I have to say that one of the, if, one of the bits of evidence on behalf of the notion that in fact some form of normalization did occur that some form of normalization did occur, I think, would have to be the creation of Israel studies. Uh, would have to be the creation of Israel studies. 
the idea that the Jewish, that the country of the Jews would be studied like the country of all other peoples, that the methods that are used for the study of other, all other countries would also be used for the study of the Jewish country, that there were no, that no methodological or substantive exception had to be made, but that, but that political scientists and sociologists and linguists and economists and, and so on could proceed with their Israeli materials as they proceeded with their Bolivian materials or their Belgian materials and so on. To me, that seems itself actually one of Zionism's successes, one of Zionism's successes. Uh, and there is something, I've always thought, there's something about the clear empirical weather of, Israeli st of Israel studies that has, its, that, that, that has a tonic, a kind of bracing effect that has a bracing effect. Um, you know, the Jews, the, uh, the, you know, the state of the Jews, the polity of the Jews, and we'll, we'll get back to this phrase, the Jews, in a moment, um, can now be studied in the same spirit in which the polity of other peoples can be studied. This is a great thing. This is a great thing. Um, I say this, this may seem obvious to you, uh, the, the younger, the older one is, the less obvious it feels. Um, I was born four years after the State of Israel was born, um, which is to say that for me, I am the last generation for whom the existence of the Jewish state will never seem like a natural fact of history. Will never seem like a natural fact of history. It will always seem like an extraordinary achievement. Uh, and uh, you can use the word miracle metaphorically if you want. It's hard not to. Um, but as I say, insofar as the premise of Israel studies is not Israeli exceptionalism, but is, but, but, but is in fact the, 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 the normalization or the normality of Israel from the standpoint of the various methodologies, then Israel studies has to be counted as one of Zionism's creations, as one of its great achievements. And um, I remember thinking on the way over here that, you know, there's that famous passage in Herzl, I think it's in Alt Neuland, somebody will correct me, Arnie, you will tell me if I'm right or wrong. Um, you know, his fantasy that one day he will say Jewish prostitutes being arrested by Jewish policemen in the streets of Haifa or somewhere. I think, it, you know, huh? Bialik? I don't believe that Bialik could have said something like that. No, 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 you're wrong. No, no, no. That's disgusting that you suggest. That's just, just, just. Oh. <laughs> but, the, you know, the fact is, the fact is the same satisfaction could have been had by someone of that mentality to have picked up any Journal of Israel Studies just to have picked up any journal and started reading the articles. Uh, because that's, that's the same fantasy come true. That's the same fantasy come true. Not perhaps as imaginatively as satisfying as what you claim is Bialik's fantasy, but, um, but, but, but it's, the same, it's the same fantasy come true. When, when you look at Israel studies this way, one of the, one, another way to put it is that Israel studies represents one of the most salient um, expressions of the discontinuity, of the discontinuity that Zionism and the creation of the state represented. The discontinuity in Jewish history, the break, the rupture, the rupture, um, the rupture. And he, this brings us to this, a very, the very interesting and complicated subject of, of, of revolutions and the dream of discontinuity. Every revolution has to dream of not just of discontinuity, but even of a kind of perfect discontinuity. Every revolution dreamed, you know, the, 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 the Russian revolution, the socialist revolutions believed that they were creating a new man. The Zionist revolution believed they were creating a new Jew. And there was something deeply sustaining, something deeply sustaining about these dreams. I remember uh, in 1988 or 89, I think I told this story also at Brandeis, and it has nothing to do with the Jews, which is one of the reasons it's nice to tell. Um, I gave a dinner here in Washington for, there happened to be an extraordinary collection of Eastern European dissidents in town for a variety of reasons, and they all gathered at, in the back room of a restaurant, and we had dinner. And there was a man among them, a remarkable man called Jarek Kuron, who was the head of CORE, which was the Polish workers' union that chose to align itself with solidarity. When the workers, when, when CORE aligned itself with solidarity, in some way, the Polish revolution against the communist regime was born. 
And Kuron was even a kind of saintly figure, and he was sitting across from me. And we were talking, and he said that he was absolutely convinced, this was 1988, that within six months, communism will be, have disappeared from Eastern Europe. So I turned, I had Leszia Kolakowski sitting next to me. He was my teacher and my friend. And I looked at him with some incredulity, and I said, I know this man is a hero, but this can't be so. And without blinking an eye, Leszia looked at me and very, in a kind of compassionate voice said, there are circumstances in which, unless you believe you can accomplish everything, you can accomplish nothing. Uh, I, will, I remember that sentence because it was the perfect expression of the kind of um, mental exaggerations that are necessary for revolutionary situations. They accompany all revolutionary situations. You cannot build big things with small beliefs. Right? You must have big beliefs to, big, to build big things. And so there is, in all revolutionary situations, including the Zionist one, there is a deep necessity and even a kind of beauty to the myths and the legends and uh, the exaggerations that occur because, in fact, they represent the grandeur of the ambition that is being acted upon. And the Zionist revolution, of course, was no exception to any of this. No exception to any of this. There were many aspects of the Zionist revolution that were classical in terms of the idea of an entire the opening up of, uh, of a perfect discontinuity, a genuine rupture, a deep and permanent break, and so on, the birth of something new. Problem is that there comes the post-revolutionary moment. And the post-revolutionary moment in all, in all revolutionary situations is always one of reassessment, of reexamination, of revisionism, if you want, um, in which the myths and the exaggerations no longer seem attractive. They seem imprecise or they seem dangerous. And there arise thinkers and scholars, and most importantly scholars, who come to correct the myths and the exaggerations of the revolutionary generation. And, th and they, they undertake this process of demythologization. Um, you know, the most famous example of this, of course, is Tocqueville in his book on the Ancien Regime and the Revolution, uh, in which he dared to show that, in fact, the magnitude of the continuity of French society that had survived the convulsion, the cataclysm of the revolution, was much greater than anyone had dare imagined, and even threw into crisis some of the assumptions of the revolution itself. And in Israel, you know, in the, in the decades after the Zionist revolution, the, the, we have witnessed the Tocquevillian moment in what is referred to as post-Zionist historiography, um, which has no doubt, um, and I say historiography, not ideology, because that's for another day and that's a different headache. Um, but there, there occurred in Israel um, a, a movement of scholars who, sh came, who arose to show that in fact the myths were myths, and one of the things they showed was that the continuities were greater than those than the advocates of discontinuity had 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 supposed that they would be, had supposed that they would be. Um, in in political life in Israel, this Tocquevillian moment, this moment of reexamination, um, occurred with the election of 1977 when Begin was elected. When Begin was elected, I remember when I was a young man. I was raised in a pocket of Polish uh, Jewish refugees, or as we now call them, survivors of the Holocaust in deepest, darkest Brooklyn. And um, I remember the adulation of my parents and everyone around them for these heroes in Israel who <laughs> were about as much unlike them as Jews as a Martian would have been. As a Martian would have been. Um, you know, when I was, when I was a young man, my Jewish identity was consumed with the question of whether it would be possible for Dov Landau to wake up as Ari Ben Kanan, if you see what I mean. Um, if you see what I mean. Begin was, Begin was elected, and all of a sudden, the bronzed socialist secular heroes and advocates of free love and collective liv uh, living who had turned them themselves into some of the greatest warriors on earth were suddenly represented by a Polish man in a little black hat who actually liked to say Kaddish as often as he could. Um, and this was a kind of return of the repressed in some way, at least as that's how I interpreted it. It was a kind of return of the repressed. And the reason I bring it up is because politically, 
that was the date, I think, that marked the recognition of the continuities that had survived the Zionist revolution. In other words, since 1977, for thoughtful people, for thoughtful observers, I think it has been clear that both the revolutionaries and the reactionaries were wrong. That is to say, the revolutionaries were wrong that a perfect discontinuity could be achieved, and the reactionaries were wrong that nothing needed to change or would change, that, that there would be some sort of significant continuity that would withstand all change, and that, in fact, in measuring, in measuring not just the success of Zionism in Israel, but in measuring many other things, what one always has to measure is the relationship between the continuities and the discontinuities. That, they're all, that, that they are both always a feature of revolutionary and post-revolutionary historical, historical experience. Um, a post-revolutionary and, and revolutionary his, a, a historical experience. Now, returning to the question of Israel studies, when one reaches this moment, which as I say has been reached, both intellectually and, and in scholarship on the one hand, and sociologically and politically on the other. The question that, one, that Israel that must be asked about Israel studies or for Israel studies is, if that's the case, then what are the continuities that are missing from Israel studies? That is to say, if Israel studies represented was in some way itself an expression of the, 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 the astonishing discontinuity of the new dispensation, of the revolution in some way, what, can is, what does Israel studies know and recognize about the things that didn't change, right? And we'll get to those things in a moment. We'll get to those things in a moment. Or more precisely, or more precisely, how does Israel studies fit within the framework that is larger than itself in terms of the continuity, which is to say, how does Israel studies fit or should it fit within the context of Jewish history? Within the context of Jewish history. I have no doubt that first and foremost, the creation of Israel was, however revolutionary it was and however spectacular the discontinuity and however dramatic the rupture and however spectacular the differences are between what now exists and what did exist, I have no question in my mind that first and foremost, what happened in 1948 was a significant event in, in Jewish history, in the history of the Jewish people, in the history of the Jewish people. That seems like a very banal remark. It is. The minute you make that remark, however, you recontextualize, you recontextualize your approach towards the study of Israel's history, right? It, you can, uh, towards a it does not begin, obviously, in 1948, but it also does not begin in 1897, and it does not begin in 1882, right? It, it, it isn't born from nothing, as it were. It isn't born from nothing. When one asks the question of of how does one place Israel studies in, Jewish stu in the context of Jewish studies, there are two ways to approach it. The first one, obviously, is an ideological one, which I guess is sort of what I was just saying. Um, ideologically, as I say, I have no question that the larger framework for the study of Israel is the history of Jewish peoplehood, which precedes even the history of Jewish nationalism. And Israel represents one extraordinary moment, one extraordinary chapter in the history of Jewish peoplehood and in the political forms and other forms that Jewish people took on, Jewish peoplehood took on, and so on and so forth. But, but again, this can seem ideological. This can seem ideological, and we don't need to be ideological. We can be empirical. We can actually speak as scholars. We can be, you know, we can speak as scholars. And in that sense, I think that speaking empirically, the history, the, the history of Israel is also an important chapter in the history of the modernization of the Jewish people. You cannot study Jewish modernity without studying history. You can't, without studying Israel's history, you cannot understand Jewish modernity without understanding what preceded it, etc. The history of Israel is also an important chapter in the history of Jewish secularization, in the history of Jewish secularization, however incomplete that secularization may be, and we're watching the, the political consequences of the incompleteness of Jewish secularization all the time, and that goes back to the question of the, of the, of, of the, the subterranean continuities that finally came, you know, br broke above ground. But again, is the you know, the Israel is a very, very important chapter in the history of the secularization of the Jewish people. 
Um, Israel is also a very important chapter in the history of Jewish self-government. Those of you who studied the history of the Jews in the exile know that despite the fact that the Jews lacked political power, they were not unfamiliar with political power, and that they developed, a, they, that, that basically they developed a genius for the creation of social economic institutions in the absence of state power, in the absence of state power, so that whereas it may be technically correct to say that the Jews did not have political institutions, if by political you mean having to do with power, they most certainly did develop political institutions in their, in their own context, along with social institutions and economic institutions. The history of Jewish self-government um, is long and interesting, and some of, some of the movement of Mishpat Ivri, right, some of the, of the late Menachem Elon HaManoach and those scholars, some of what they were trying to show, I think, was that the history of Jewish self-government, the history of Jewish corporate life, corporate in the old sense, um, in the exile, the history of Jewish law as expressing that corporate life would have some bearing, or at least would be interesting to compare to, because the question of its bearing again gets into questions of ideology, but, but would at least be interesting to compare to the, 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 the forms that Jewish corporate life would take in, in state sovereignty, in state sovereignty. And in that sense, it, once again, this has been reinserted into the larger framework of Jewish history. Um, and the history of Israel is also a very important chapter in the history of the Jewish people's relationship to power. To power, and I mean to their own power. To their own power. Um, you know, this is a subject that people think is not all that interesting because for so many years the subject was Jewish powerlessness. Uh, but the fact is that, you know, I've off, I always tell young Jews who present me with, over, with, with overly idealized images of Israel's behavior, I always tell them that, um, that there were many reasons why Jews did not s commit certain crimes over 2,000 years, and one of them is that we lacked the power to do so. Um, we now have the power to do so. Now, the question of whether which crimes Israel has or has not committed and what Israel's record is compared to the true miscreants in the world, I, we're not going to get into that now. We're not going to get into that now. But the fact is, but the fact is, the Jews have once again acquired state power. The Jews have traditions, moral traditions, legal traditions about the use of power, religious traditions and secular traditions by now as well, both. And that you and one way of understanding the Israeli experiment with Jewish power would be to understand those traditions and to apply those traditions to the study of these things. And finally, and finally, and this is a long and colorful and complicated and depressing subject in some ways, the, st the study of Israel is also a study in the history of the Jewish religion, of the Jewish religion, because Judaism has taken certain forms in its, in it, in its incarnations in Israel. Um, you know, the, I mean, there is just the example of the Rabbanut Tarashit, for example, um, which, as all of you know, was not given to Moshe at Sinai, but was created by Sir Herbert Samuel in 1937. Um, but, um, but just the institution of the Rabbanut, or the various types of religiosity that have developed in the state, and their relationship in, in an internecine way to other, to other denominations or types of Jewish re religiosity or religious organization, the relationship of, of Jewish religious life to secular life within a Jewish context and within general context. All of these are questions that Jewish historians of the modern period have been wrestling with for a long time. These are not unfamiliar questions. And these are questions which the Israeli experience provides a very, very important chapter of. A very, very important chapter of, you see. So in, 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 all, in all these ways, and there are others that one could enumerate as well, it is not as far-fetched or as reactionary or as analytically unexciting to think that reinserting Israel studies in some way into the framework of Jewish studies, and again, I'm not speaking about the hegemony of this field or that field and so on, I mean, um, you know, uh, but, 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 but the recontextualization, or rather, let's just say, the, the, the adequate recognition within Israel studies of the continuities that I, would describe, that I was describing would be as analytically illuminating as its very, very successful study of elements of Israeli life and experience that in fact have indeed been deeply discontinuous with traditional Jewish life. And about this discontinuity again, 
um, th there must be no doubt. There must be no doubt. Most of the articles that appear in journals of Israel studies could not have appeared about Jewish communities before because this is in so many ways a genuinely a new reality. This is a new reality. It is a new reality. But as I say, it is not only, it is not only a new reality. One final point and then we can, we can discuss these things. There is one enormous complicating factor in fact, calling it a complicating factor is even a little bit condescending and not right. There, well, there is one huge complication to everything I've just said, and it is that Israel is not only a state of Jews. And it is that Israel is not only a state of Jews. Jews are not the only people who live in the Jewish state. And obviously there are limits. And, and here, here is where the reinsertion or the recontextualization of certain aspects of the study of Israeli experience from the standpoint of Jewish history, here obviously is where it reaches its limit. Here is where it reaches its limit. But I would argue, but having recognized that, and having recognized that as a moral matter, not just as an analytical matter, I mean, it would just to say the Jews who are, the non-Jews who are citizens of Israel are citizens in the way that the Jews are citizens of Israel. And, the, and we must beware of of, 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 of alliances between Israel studies and Jewish studies that would even, even unintentionally read out of the, of the curriculum, of, of the program of study, those Israeli citizens who happen not to be Jews, who happen not to be Jews. And yet, it's not in, yet the, 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 the Jewish studies perspective is not entirely wasted or lost, even in this, even in this regard, because one of the things that we have to study is the history of the Jewish relationship with the other, is the history of the Jewish relationship with the other. That is a very long and important story. That is a very long, the Jewish relationship with the other was something that occurred in times of when Jews had power and when Jews lacked power. It, 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 the, hist the history of this subject includes periods of Jewish sovereignty and of Jewish dispossession. Of, of, Jew, of, of Jewish statehood and, uh, or commonwealthhood and of Jewish exile. Both, both. And the and attitudes, and I don't have to tell you, you all you know, read the newspapers in all the relevant languages, um, many of the difficulties, political and social and ethical, that Israel may be experiencing in its relations to non-Jews within Israel are not unrelated to certain traditional Jewish attitudes and traditional Jewish teachings about the other, about the other. Um, I mean, this is plain as day. Now, you'd have to, if you're studying this empirically, you'd actually have to demonstrate various connections and so on. But these connections can be demonstrated. These connections can be demonstrated. So even this aspect of Israel, the aspect of the study of Israel that for which Jewish history would seem least relevant of all, which is the study of those citizens of Israel who are not Jews, in some way it is still relevant because one of the things that has to be studied is how it is that Jews feel about Muslims, Christians, uh, on the one hand, or um, gay people, on the other. I mean, there are all kinds of others. There are all sorts of others. They're not just ethnic others and political others, right? And that, if you really need, to, if you want to understand, that th those, are, those are cultural questions. Those are cultural questions. And, and insofar as they're moral questions, they're also cultural questions. And in order, to, in order to focus on them, once again, the prior history of the Jewish people may also be relevant, may also be able to cast light upon the analysis, the understanding of some of these complicated, some of these complicated issues in a multi-ethnic state that calls itself a Jewish state, that is a Jewish state but which is nonetheless a multi-ethnic state and always will be, God willing, a multi-ethnic state and always will be a multi-ethnic state. So, okay, I, that's, those are my thoughts. That's what I thought I would say to you and now we can converse. Thank you. Uh, I want to pick up on two points that you made and maybe connect them to some of the conversation from the earlier panels uh, also. You spoke uh, uh, initially about Israel studies as a step in normalization, uh, and I agree with that. Um, 
But I also want to point to a challenge there, uh, and that is we, in, in the first panel today, one of the topics that came up was some of the parallels between Jewish studies and Israel studies and their, their entry into the academic arena in the US. Mm -hmm. um, Jewish studies really coming of age uh, on the US campus in the 1970s, beginning in the late 60s perhaps, uh, as Jews became white folks, so to speak, as Jews were becoming mainstream. And in Israel studies, we speak a lot about mainstreaming Israel studies. Um, but the Israel studies experience in many ways is the opposite. And I think there's something to think about, that Israel studies has grown at, out of a perception, uh, probably justified, of Israel increasingly becoming a pariah on the US campus. And that sets it in a whole different uh, relationship with, uh, with the academic fields uh, in which it's placed. And I throw that out as a point for thought. And then one uh, other quick comment. Um, I actually uh, want to take issue to some degree with your characterization of the new historiography of the 80s and 90s, where I think it's perhaps one of its greatest weaknesses was that it actually did not go to recapture the continuities, mm. but assumed yeah, yeah. rupture, perhaps even more in a, in a more radical way yeah, than, uh, than the older historiography. And it's only, I would say, in recent years with what some people have termed the post-post-Zionist uh, yeah. historiography that there's a turn to recapture some of the, some of the continuities. Uh, and in that context, just to connect it then with our earlier discussion, uh, Arnie, for example, you, you, you have been very concerned with the issue of Hebrew. If we look at what goes on in AIS conferences, Association for Israel Studies conferences, there's some glaring omissions, Hebrew literature being one of them, for example. And this goes to questions of, uh, Hebrew literature is not entirely absent, but insufficiently yeah. represented, and that goes to issues of continuity and inclusion right. and boundaries. That's, that's a very rich, Sorry, Arya Sapoznik, UCLA. Okay, um, I, you're absolutely right about about the post zionist historians. I, I misspoke if I meant to say that they brought the continuities back. What I meant to say is that they were the demythologizers, and that, that, which is a very perfectly trite remark. There's nothing interesting in that. Um, on the question of um, Jewish studies and Israel studies coming of age at various points, again, I haven't lived in an academic environment for 30 years. I'm a very lucky man. Um, though I visit often and so on. I think it's, um, I, I guess when I read, when I open journals of Israel studies, one of the reasons I like them is because they seem deeply unapologetic to me. That is to say, you wouldn't know from most of them whether the campus on which they were produced was hostile to Israel or not hostile. This is an old Jewish tradition, by the way. When you look at Jewish medieval literature, you would n have almost not a clue unless you looked in highly specialized genres of what the actual experience of adversity that these communities were living in was like. Um, so, um, and I think it's probably best for Israel studies not to get into the apologia business um, because other people can handle that. Um, I think also that um, what you say about the mainstreaming of Jewish studies is true, um, though I will say, I mean, it is certainly true that with the establishment of the AJS, everything exploded, and um, there were Jewish scholars everywhere, and there's no question that certainly the mean level, the average level of Jewish scholarly knowledge now is so much higher than it was when I was in the field. It is astonishing. I mean, I was just telling someone a few weeks ago that it is time for some very learned and foolhardy individual to begin to, to begin to consider, to entertain the idea of writing a new history of the Jews, because there is so much that we now know about the, certainly the centuries in the exile that we just did not know before. Manuscripts have been read, it, b b printed editions have been corrected, uh, misattributions have been, have been fixed. I mean, we have, we have a, a, a genuinely new map. It's astonishing. However, I will say that um, that didn't come out of nothing. And in mid-'70s, when I went into the field, it was, I was very, very conscious that even though there weren't Jewish studies departments everywhere, I had been preceded by two or three generations of scholarly giants. Uh, of scholarly giants, and I don't mean just at the Hebrew University, I mean at the Jewish Theological Seminary and at Columbia University and elsewhere at Princeton. So whereas it's true that the field had not exploded, um, in some ways the golden age for certain, under certain descriptions may be passed. As for Hebrew, um, don't get me started. Um, 
I could not agree more. I think that, um, well, let me just say that the single greatest crime that the American Jewish community is perpetrating against the Jewish tradition is its belief that it can receive, develop, and transmit the Jewish tradition not in a Hebrew language. This is unprecedented. There have been many Hebrew languages. Rabbis have always complained about levels of literacy. But when you look at the level of American Jewish illiteracy and the pride that attaches to it, right? And the pride that attaches to it. Because so what if they don't read Hebrew? They'll cook Jewish food or they'll, they like klezmer, right? Try raising a kid on klezmer, right? Right? Nothing against klezmer. There's a Bundist here somewhere. I've got to be clear about that. Um, um, but, um, so I, but I think, again, I don't know what, what requirements are for um, Israeli studies degree. I would not graduate an Israeli studies degree without fluent Hebrew. I mean, I simply would not graduate it. I mean, I would not award any, I would not award any academic recognition to a scholar of Israel who cannot read Hebrew. It seems preposterous to me. Um, I'd rather they didn't know statistics. Um, I'd rather they didn't know statistics. And God knows when they need to learn a language, it took 15 years for every Jew in America to learn Microsoft Word. Right? So it's really, when they want to, they can. So I, but that, this is a huge subject. You've pushed, as they say, a button. Um, but I think, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, on this subject, I'm a maniac. Um, and I, if, as far as Israel studies go, it's, I mean, do people get degrees in French studies and, without knowing French? I mean, it's, it's completely incomprehensible to me. It's completely incomprehensible to me. Um, and I think that there should be, as, as they say, a zero tolerance policy for illiteracy in Israeli studies. I mean, I think that's just, uh, that's just the way it is, I th or it should be. Um. I would like to continue on the line of normalization, which I think is really one of the central issues, not of Israel, but of Jewish existence. And um, it was Weizmann, maybe someone corrects me, but I think it was Bialik, Weizmann. It was Bialik. Who <laughs> <laughs> Weizmann who said, not, not your quote, Weizmann who said that, you know, Albania, the famous right. quote, and he said, yes, Albania, that's what we want to be. Um, he also had other quotes, but I think that was uh, one which directs into, mm -hmm. into that. Um, now, you said the creation of Israel studies departments or areas, studies, or what establishment of Israel studies on American campuses is a sign of this normalization. I wonder if this is so. How many Albanian study centers, how many, you mentioned Belgian or Bolivian mm -hmm. study centers do we have? So we might have in a few years, maybe 50 Israel centers, Israel study centers. Is that maybe another sign of the non-normalization? Is a rather small no, state. No, I, I don't think so, Michael. I think, look, I think that um, the Jews are good at this and that, um, that when they set out to study something that's dear to them, they proceed to establish what they need to establish and so on. I mean, what I conclude from this is not that there's still something anomalous about Israeli studies, but that, that the Albanians should get their act together on <laughs> campus. <laughs> Um, Get me wrong, I'm not against I, Israel I, I, Studies I, I, Michael, centers. I know about your long history of anti-Albanian sentiments, <laughs> but it's just... Uh, um, but look, look, the, w I, so, no, I don't think that that makes it in any way anomalous. I really don't. Um, I do think, well, let's re I, well, let me just say this thing, go back to the normalization question. But I do think that there was a time when the emphasis on Israeli studies over Jewish studies made a certain kind of emotional, cultural sense. I mean, we were talking about this, I think, last week. I've, I've, I've never understood, you know, the, 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 the center at Columbia, which was established, I think, by Baron, was, in, in, yeah, yeah, no, 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 but I mean, afterward, is called the Center for Israel and Jewish Studies. I never understood that. I always thought that the J word has to come before the I word, because the J word is the larger rubric for the I word. The only reason Israel studies interests me is because it's about Jews. Um, and I'm not interested in Albanian studies for that reason. Um, so I think that the, the, the Ikar and the Tafel, or the, the, the larger premise and the small, you know, again, maybe that's what we're talking about, is what the larger rubric is and what the lesser rubric is. Um, you know, it was all very nice about Albania. It was all very nice to to dream of being Albania, as I said, that was a kind of necessary fiction. We all know that the Jews were never in any danger of becoming Albanians. 
um, and partly because not and not because of the way we were treated by non-Jews. That was not the issue. I mean, that goes back to the essential and very rich ambiguity in the definition of Jewish identity. That goes back to the to the to that tangle that nobody has ever satisfactorily been able to uh, take apart, or probably shouldn't, between religion and peoplehood and culture and civilization. You know, what are we? We're all these things. Are we just this? No. Are we just that? No. So we were not in any danger. I think. I mean, but as I said, that was that. But but you can't make a revolution unless you can believe that you can be an Albanian, if you see what I mean. Um, and in that sense, I've always, I'm not one of those people who are angry at the exaggerations and the myths of the, found, of the founders. Not at all. I remember once I was at a, at a debate in New York about post-Zionism with a gentleman, some of you may know, some, a philosopher named Adi Ophir, who was a very rabid post-Zionist. And when he looked at me and he said, but our parents lied to us. And I said, right. Um, my parents lied to me. What do you propose I do? Overthrow them? <laughs> I mean, divorce them? Um, you know, breaking news, his parents lied to him. Um, so I, I actually look upon, I actually look upon the, the exaggerations, the myths, the legends, the, the grand, I, with, it, it moves me deeply. I have to say, it moves me, de now, it doesn't move me when it involved the, the death of innocent people who were not Jews, and it doesn't move me when people permitted themselves certain policies in 48, 49 that seem regrettable or, or even immoral, and I mean, I'm not being, I'm not just saying, oh, isn't it lovely, but the state could not have been built, the language could not have been revived, and more than revived, created. Cre I mean, you know, when I sit at home, I, I've got an old map of Israel, from 1927, a beautiful old map in my library standing against the wall. And then near it, I have the entirety of Ben Yehuda's dictionary. I have to say, Ben Yehuda's dictionary, the sight of it moves me more. Because to me, it looks like, I mean, this was really, this was a vast creation. None of this could have been accomplished without these myths and, the exact, and, and these, without the, romance, without the romance of revolution without the romance of revolution. So I'm not angry, I just think these things, they, they straighten themselves out. They straighten themselves out. Um, so I just want to mention that, that phrase, Heim Shikru Lanu, mm -hmm. is such a cliche, and it appears in that generation over and over again, so you don't know if it means anything anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, that's, that's that's the bottom line all the time. Yeah, yeah. If somebody lied to us. And if you say, how do they lie to us? Well, they lie to us. In what way do they lie to us? Well, they, they, they told us that, you know, that uh, nobody was killed in the war or something. I mean, ridiculous thing. But also people, uh, you know, the pro there's a certain kind of rationalist and a certain kind of progressivism that, doesn't, that fails to understand the place of illusion in reality. You know, I mean, you know, th none of the great works of ancient art that we treasure so much would have existed if the people who made them did not believe in perfectly outlandish and foolish things, right? All of the Egyptian wings of every museum would not exist if the people in ancient Egypt did not believe that the pharaoh was about to take a trip up the Nile and needed these little fruits, right? So, I mean, th th il illusion is an important part of reality. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not defending lying. But the idea, well, et cetera, et cetera. I think you're absolutely right. I think you're absolutely right. Yeah, sure. Um, yes, I just had a question about one of, one of introduction. I'm Jeremiah Reamer, Michael Brenner's translator. Um, I, I just had a question. I'm a big fan of Tocqueville, and so I, I'm, I'm intrigued by that analogy, but I'm still trying to wrap my head around it. Um, if you talk about, you know, France today, you can show that, um, whether it's Sarkozy or Hollande, they're, that people in a sort of Jacobin tradition are heirs to the absolutist tradition, as, as, as Tocqueville said. And whether you're dealing with responses to the Euro or reorganizing industrial relations, that's, um, that's still a persistent pattern in France. But w w what exactly is the analogy in Israel? Are you saying that Ben-Gurion and Mamlach the Yut are the Jacobins to some diaspora no, what I'm saying or is, or Likud as the Jacobins. And no, I don't know 
who the Jacobins were. I can name one or two early Zionists who were definitely Jacobins, but um, no, I don't mean that exactly. All I meant to say was that that um, facets of a culture and of a society that were supposed to have been um, either erased or reconceived almost beyond the point of recognition, in fact, um, were not erased and were still recognizable. That that they you know that the that the explosive drama of the revolution obscured that its claim to have remade everything was false. Was false. That's what I think Tocqueville really showed, and that's why that little book of his is so shocking. Um, that's Brian. why it's so shocking. Brian. And Brian. Um, and that there Brian? was there there were these subterranean, and they weren't even subterranean. In fact, they don't have to be subterranean. You know, you have to have eyes to see. I mean, every, you know, re revolutions also teach cognitive habits, you know, and there are things that can be right on fr in front of your nose that you just don't see or that you misdescribe. And everybody was looking for the new, and for perfectly good reasons. I mean, Jewish history had to be changed by the Jews. In other words, the, the new conception of historical agency that Zionism represented for Jews seems perfectly justifiable. And the despair about, um, about the elimination or the mitigation of anti-Semitism in Europe seems perfectly justifiable, and God knows was justified subsequently, and so on. So, um, ev and there were very good reasons for people to look for the new and to try to create the new. And, and, you know, and the great modern, the great change in modern politics, the fundamental principle of modern politics is that you can change things, that you don't have to wait for the world to change, that you can actually change the world. Now, but again, you know, it gets complicated because in your obsession with change, you see only change, you look for the new, and meanwhile the old is right there. You haven't, and, and again, sometimes the old that has not been eliminated, you regret that it wasn't. And I don't mean it murdering people, I'm just saying, but other times you realize, thank God, they didn't get their hands on this because it's actually very, very precious. And, you know, so in, in, the, in the period after the revolution, what you begin to understand is that olam kamin hagon oheg, and which is both a conservative and a liberal statement, depending on how you want to interpret it. Um, so all I'm talking about is the persistence through the great explosions of things that preceded the explosions and that defy any new description of the new reality or any new definition of the new reality that omits th important elements of society, culture, psychology, uh, thought, whatever, that preceded them, that preceded them. And so it's always about, if you will, the ratio, but that's a, s I don't want to speak quantitatively, it's always about the, 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 re the relationships between the continuities and the discontinuities. It is never just about one or the other, though different historical moments for, different, for reasons of different historical need may, we may, may italicize the one or the other. But it's never, they're always both present. And a responsible account of Israel would have to take into account both these things. Both, that's, that's all I'm saying. Hi, uh, Matt Evans, Penn State. Uh, um, I, following what you were saying, uh, I was thinking of the deconstructing of myths, and I was trying to place that in an American context to see if there was an equivalent. Uh, it would be, um, even though some of them have been, no one really portrays George Washington as a toothless old slave owner, or anything that the myth of him being so honest he admitted cutting down the cherry tree, and things like that have lived on for many more generations as compared to the way the Israeli myths, uh, even Trumpledor is stricken and yeah. uh, things like that. I was wondering if you can think of any other well, I think it's, yeah. myths that have been cut down in the same way, and if this is a healthy thing that Israelis have done it so quickly or perhaps uh, not a healthy thing. Well, I think the first thing that needs to be said is that all of the Zionist experience took place after, um, after European culture became historicist, in other words, in the age of historicism. So, um, you know, it is true that, it, that it, it took longer for people to focus on the fact that Jefferson held slaves or that Andrew Jackson um, tormented Native Americans and sent them on that horrible death march to, to the Midwest. 
Um, but when historiography, critical historiography, was established in the United States, it didn't take that long. It didn't take that long. Um, it didn't take that long. I mean, people were going after Parson Weems from the very beginning, but that's not that interesting. But I think, so the first thing I would say is that, um, is that Jewish nationalism, in fact, European nationalism in some way had something to do with the development of historicism. I mean, we know this from a variety of historians. Uh, the second thing I would say is that um, I don't think there's anything wrong with how accelerated the demythologization happens in Israel, partly because you may have noticed that Israel is the most highly accelerated place on earth um, in almost every respect. I mean, the Hebrew language is becoming so, so, so slangy and so quickly, so, so fast that in a couple of years I expect it fully to disappear and then American Jews can feel perfectly clear about everything. Um, but you know, so the pace of change has been great, but um, but again, it, 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 you know, the sons, it's, a, it's, it's partly a drama of fathers and sons, like my interlocutor, Professor Ophir, who complained that his father lied to him. Um, you know, no, I, I don't think there's anything, I think it's, it's it, I don't mean to sound condescending people, it's, but it's a healthy phenomenon, I think. It's a healthy phenomenon. I mean, it basically consists in a search for truth. Um, and in, in the idea that Israeli identity and the justification for Israel, um, insofar as Israel just justified in the way that, say, Belgium doesn't, um, though actually Belgium, Belgian identity is actually coming under some pressure. Maybe that's a bad example. Um, yeah. Um, but I think that it, 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 is, it comes from an, an attitude of intellectual confidence that Israeli identity can withstand historiographical truth and that it can't be premised upon lies about the past. Um, and I think that's just fine. I think that's just fine. Oh. Elon Trowen, Brandeis. Um, first of all, I, I regret that you retracted your comment on post-Zionism. I actually thought what you meant by it was that post-Zionism uh, saw the evils of Israeli and the mistakes of Israeli society not from the perspective of the 1980s, but thought that the mistakes were deeply rooted, whether in 1948, whether in the founding of... Uh, the kibbutz or in any other kind of event. And mm -hmm. uh, it sought to find and establish um, what was wrong in terms of the very beginnings and the articulation of Zionist history. So you have a chance to retract again. No, no. But the no. question is other. <coughs> um, we've spent this day as uh, academics talking about the issues involved in teaching in the academy, mm -hmm. Israel studies and its relationship to Jewish studies. You've recently won the Dan David Prize as a public intellectual, and your field of education is far wider than all of us here in this room put together. And I'm curious uh, to ask you as, a, as an educator, how you see yourself in your enterprise at this special venue of the New Republic, oh. or wherever you publish, yeah. and to what extent do you see yourself as an educator, and what are the challenges you confront in trying to present Israel to the public? And yeah, that's a very good question. Um, let me just say quickly about, the p I see what you're saying about the post-Zionist historiography. What I meant to say was that I agreed what, uh, with the observation that even that, the, criti that the, criti the critical insights that they developed into Israel itself were not also involved in readmitting in readmitting those aspects of traditional Jewish experience and so on that could cast light on, I mean, they had nothing to do with that. They had nothing to do with that. Um, actually, yeah, they had nothing to do with that. Um, you ask a very good question. Um, uh, I tried to demonstrate by example that it is possible for an adult human mind to contain two ideas in it at the same time. And what I mean is that um, I wrote a piece about this once because I got very frustrated and felt kind of lonely, actually, that basically the debate about Israel, by the way, not just in, in the general world but also in the Jewish world, has been polarized and coarsened like all the debates about everything. So in the Jewish world, too, it's the sharks and the jets. And there are these two packages, and you would take one or you take the other. You take one or you take the other. Um, I have tried to show by example that it is possible to love Israel and to criticize Israel with equal emphasis at all times, at all times. 
and not to let to, and not to allow either the expression of one's love for Israel or the expression of one's criticism of Israel be reduced to a to-be-sure sentence. So, because normally the debate goes like this. Of course Israel must do, of course the Iranians are developing nuclear weapons that might be used about Israel, comma, but that the creation of the settlement in Migron, the outpost, is completely outrageous. Or, the other camp says, whereas the creation of Migron is of course a stupid thing for Israel to do, the only thing we must deal with now is the Iranian nuclear capability. When I was a boy, I think we talked a little bit about this at Brandeis that night. When I was a boy and I was studying, the, a young man studying the history of Zionism, one of the things that left an indelible mark upon my understanding, not just of this question, but upon life, was Ben Gurion's famous remark in the aftermath of the white paper that they will fight the white paper as if there's no Hitler and Hitler as if there's no white paper. I thought to myself, that's it. There is never just one threat and there is never just one problem. And the idea that there is only one overwhelming threat to which all other threats may be subordinated, A, may be true, but only in times of apocalyptic emergency, only in times of apocalyptic emergency, and B, is an attempt to, to impose an ideological framework upon the analysis of reality. Um, so I have tried, when I talk about Israel and when I write about Israel, I, I don't take any deep breaths before I express my affection for the state and its society and its people, and I don't take any deep breaths and try to explain things before I begin to say that Netanyahu is wreaking, as far as I'm concerned, a disaster upon Israel for not dealing with the Palestinian problem. And I try to say both those things in the same tone, neither of them in italics, certainly not one of them only in italic, and just try to give an example of, of this kind of connectedness. Um, now, this is the sort of connectedness one has, I have to say, that one has when one feels truly at home. When one feels truly at home. It has been my good fortune to feel truly at home. Um, not just in Israel, as I, I, I'm at home wherever Jews are. I mean, it's, um, and, but, but, but what matters most to me is that this debate has been so distorted that, you know, I, I'm telling you, either you believe that Israel is the sole obstacle to peace, and therefore the Ayatollah Khomeini has no intention of building a nuclear weapon, and therefore that Netanyahu represents a reactionary imposition of fascism upon the Jewish people, and that, um, and that Barack Obama is, is our first Jewish president, and so on, or you believe that Barack Obama is the sole source of all evil and the Iranians are going to weaponize in the morning and any way the Jews have a right to settle and who are the Goyim to tell us anything, right? This is, all, this is what there is. That's what's on offer out there. That's, what on, that's what's on offer out there. So you either take this package or you take that package. Everything neatly adds up. You have the answers to all questions in each of the packages. And there used to be a more complicated tradition of um, really, I, I want to say, of Jewish solidarity, which is what we're talking about, because I regard my Zionism first and foremost as a form of Jewish solidarity. Um, there used to be a kind of Jewish solidarity which had no problem making criticism because it had no doubts about its love and had no problem expressing its love because it was perfectly prepared to express criticism. I mean, I remember, you know, there was a book came out, um, and again, it's always about the emphasis. It's always the emphasis, and nobody gets it right. I mean, my younger friend and former colleague, Peter Beinart, published that notorious book of his a few years ago that was incredibly exciting for 10 minutes. And, um, and he, you know, he said to me, and I've known him forever, and we were once, he, was, he used to be a Ben Byatt years ago. And once he said to me, you know, criticism is also an expression of love. And I said to him, Peter, yes, but it can't be the only expression of love. It is an expression of love, but if it's the only expression of love, then I'd look to your love, you see. So what, what I try to do is this. I mean, that's basically what I, it's, it's not that easy because people don't get it. I mean, I wrote a piece a couple of months ago expressing my, my dark belief that I may not see peace between Israelis and Palestinians in my lifetime. I'm still a good Shalom Achshav guy. I'm still for two states. I'm still against the settlements. I still think that the Palestinians have been idiotic three or four times in a row over 40 years. All this stuff. But just express, when I wrote this piece, 
just what I thought would happen would happen. The left thought that I had defected, that I had betrayed them, and the columnists on the right in Israel welcomed me to a recognition of what reality is really like. And, you know, you don't know what to do. But that's, that's, that's what I try to do. That's what I try to do. Thank you, Leon. I think uh, we all thank you for concluding our conference in that way and letting, letting us all go home without without clear answers and packages, and I hope you will I be should say, I'm sorry I wasn't able to be here earlier today, so I wasn't well, familiar with the earlier... you summarized wonderfully all what right, you didn't hear today. Okay, that was all right. wonderful. All right. um, I'm sure we have... I hope we'll have you back, even before the Center of Albanian Studies yes, is being yes. established. Mm. And I would like to thank all of you, those who uh, were part of the panels, those who listened, those who were part of the audience again my thanks to Laura for making this possible and for Nancy and everyone else Pam um, Dean Starr is he still here um, thank you for um, sitting here through the whole Sunday which is not what we all used to do on a Sunday and I think you were all hopefully rewarded for it and um, this should be first of many other occasions where we get together and discuss Israel studies and other topics. Thank you. Thank you.